In the name of God, hello and welcome. I'm Ali Reza Maladi with the latest coming to you live from Tehran. The death toll from the novel coronavirus in Iran surpassed 5,900 on Wednesday, while more than 73,000 positive cases have recovered from the disease. Speaking at a daily press conference on Wednesday, Iran's health ministry spokesman Kiyanush Jahanpour said COVID-19 has taken the lives of 80 patients during the past 24 hours, bringing the total death toll to 5,957. He also noted that the number of people tested positive for the coronavirus across Iran has arisen to 93,657 following the detection of 1,073 new cases since the day before. He said at least 73,791 positive cases in the country have fully recovered from the coronavirus and have been discharged from hospitals. He also noted that among the patients undergoing treatment in hospitals at present, 2,965 are in critical conditions because of more severe infections. He added that more than 453,000 coronavirus diagnostic tests have been carried out across Iran so far. The British government has tightened restrictions on the British public in a bid to contain the spread of the coronavirus in the country. As of Tuesday morning, all unessential public buildings and places are closed, ranging from libraries to churches, outdoors and gyms and playgrounds, and all social events, including weddings, have been stopped. The public has been told to stay home and can only have leave home for essential trips to buy food or medications to provide essential care, travel to work if absolutely necessary, and to exercise once a day. Life under lockdown. It certainly is the new normal. But how much longer will people in Britain have to stay indoors, homeschooling their kids, using apps to check in on loved ones, and worrying about their businesses? We asked people on the streets of London what their impression was. I think the government said they're going to check again on 7th of May. I don't know if they're, if they're actually going to let the lockdown go, but I think it's going to extend even further. But it's tough, but you're just going to have to, we're just going to have to deal with it. They will never tell us that, you know what I mean? You know, um, for all we know, there could be a cure already, you know, but they still won't tell us when it's going to end. You know, I can't honestly see it ending until maybe... April, May next year. We should really be able to have some sort of date, deadline. I mean, places like Sweden, where my husband's from, it's up to you whether you want to go out. They're not having this huge lockdown. So I think people should be given the choice. Personally, me, I'm becoming a little bit emotional about all this. It's just mind-numbing, not knowing. It's just your whole life's on hold. You don't know. Other European countries like Italy, Spain, Germany and Denmark are slowly coming out of lockdown and are walking people through the process. However, here in the UK, the government insists it would be irresponsible to give people false hope. So what do Londoners think of this approach? It just feels like people are just on edge. They don't know what to do. There's no clarity with what, what's going on. Every country is doing the same thing. Like They don't know what's the standard procedure in this case, so they're just experimenting. So I guess you, know, you cannot blame them 100%. But I think that should be more responsible with the PPE. I think it's, it's, uh, we're all quick to point the finger and to say, well, we would have done it different, but it's unprecedented, and I think um, it's, it's easy to just sit there in judgment sometimes. Yes, they have made mistakes, and they are going to make mistakes, and I think they're learning as they go along. We're watching the world. And, yes, probably we shouldn't have held Cheltenham Festival, but hindsight's a great thing. The government's medical experts say physical distancing may last for the rest of the year. The British are being patient, with more than two-thirds saying they're prepared to stay home until COVID-19 is fully contained. Now, in, life, in light of Washington's incessant acts of military adventurism in the Persian Gulf region, President Hassan Rouhani has once again reminded the United States to whom the waterway truly belongs. In remarks on the occasion of the National Persian Gulf Day, President Hassan Rouhani said the United States administration should understand the circumstances surrounding the body of water by taking into consideration both its name and the nation that has preserved it for thousands of years, and therefore stop hatching plots against the Iranian nation every day. 
The chief executive congratulated Iranians on the national occasion, laying emphasis on the nation's entitlement to the waterway that bears a special significance to the Islamic Republic. President Rouhani added that the Iranian armed forces, including the naval forces serving either the Islamic Revolution Guard Corps or the army, as well as the forces enlisted with Iran's law enforcement force and volunteer besiege forces, have invariably guaranteed the security of the waterway and its coastlines. Iranian President Hassan Rouhani and Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan have called for the further expansion of bilateral ties, especially trade cooperation. During a telephone conversation on Wednesday, the two top officials discussed a variety of issues, including bilateral ties. President Rouhani called for the reopening of the border markets of Iran and Pakistan while observing health care guidelines, saying it will lead to the growth of Tehran Islamabad trade relations. He also praised Pakistan's opposition to the illegal U.S. sanctions against Iran, expressing hope that the two countries will boost their economic cooperation. President Rouhani also called for the implementation of the agreements already signed between Tehran and Islamabad. Imran Khan also emphasized the development and deepening of relations with Iran, especially economic and trade cooperation, and welcomed the resumption of trade activities on the borders of the two countries and the cooperation of border markets in accordance with healthcare guidelines. Now, the Iranian ambassador to the United Nations has called U.S. efforts to extend Iran's arms embargo in contravention of Security Council Resolution 2231, which endorsed the 2015 multilateral nuclear deal, saying the claim that the United States is a still, party, is, is a still a party to the agreement, following it, uh, it to invoke a sanctions a snapback under certain pretexts, is nothing but an unprecedented joke. My colleague Omid Dari has the scoop. In an exclusive interview published on Wednesday, Majid Takrawanji said, by withdrawing from the JCPOA, the United States violated both Resolution 2231 and its commitments as stipulated under the JCPOA, adding that Washington's international obligations have nothing to do with who is in charge in the White House. Washington is reportedly planning to use a threat to trigger a return of all UN sanctions against the Iran as leverage to get the 15th member Security Council to prolong the arms embargo in Tehran. The United States has reportedly circulated a draft UN resolution only to a small number of Security Council members, which would indefinitely extend a UN arms embargo on Iran set to expire in October. Ravanchi went on to say that the current U.S. administration is trying to strike the expiration of the arms embargo from Resolution 2231, saying the embargo itself was unjustly imposed on Iran from the very beginning. He also reacted to the reports that the U.S. could still invoke a sanction and snapback because it is named as a deal participant in the 2015 U.N. resolution, calling it a jest. He said the comments were stunning and unacceptable to the international community, citing the May 8, 2019 statement by the White House that clearly said it had terminated a U.S. participation in the JCPOA. The removal of Iran's arms embargo is based on the nuclear deal between Tehran and major world powers officially known as the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, JCPOA. In defiance of global criticism, the U.S. unilaterally withdrew from the JCPOA, which President Donald Trump called the worst deal ever in May 2018 and reimposed the anti-Iran sanctions. Elsewhere, in his remarks, the senior diplomat also reacted to Trump's threats to hit Iranian vessels in the Persian Gulf. He said that over the past 40 years, the Iranian people have shown that they will not back down in the face of threats, and in practice, they have shown that they stand up to those who want to speak with an aggressive, threatening, or insulting language to them. He has threatened that we are patrolling within the framework of international regulations in the Persian Gulf, which is close to our borderland and our waters. 
Uh, we have maintained the security of this waterway from many years and will continue to do so. The remarks came after Trump tweeted last Wednesday that he had told the United States Navy to shoot down and destroy Iranian gunboats that harass U.S. ships. He said later in the day that U.S. Navy ships would shoot out of the water Iranian gunboats that get too close. And finally, as the coronavirus spreads across the globe, it appears to be setting off a devastating feedback loop with another of the greatest forces of our time, economic inequality. In societies where the virus is, it is deepening the consequences of inequality, pushing many of the burdens onto the losers of today's paralyzed economies and labor markets. Even before COVID-19 came along, more than 20% of EU residents were living on or below the poverty line. Now things are getting much worse. The European Commission has just signed off on a so-called banking package designed to ensure financial institutions keep lending to households and businesses throughout the EU. So I rely on the Parliament and the Council to deal with our proposal as a matter of urgency and to adopt this package by June at the latest. Many day centres, food banks and soup kitchens for homeless people in the EU have closed due to a lack of protective clothing for staff. Other vulnerable groups are also at risk. The European Association of Service Providers for Persons with Disabilities has just issued a statement claiming there is a lack of protective equipment and testing for people with special needs. There is also a problem surrounding staffing numbers when it comes to carers. Amid the lockdowns, domestic violence against women and children has soared. However, the most vulnerable of all right now are the elderly. In some EU countries, more than 50% of coronavirus-related deaths are happening in nursing homes. All of this is fueling mental illness. There's a lot of um, depression and um, uh, suicides, high suicide rates at the minute, you know, and uh, financial burdens on everybody. EU energy ministers held a video conference on Tuesday. They called for financial supports for their sector. They also agreed to continue to back the European Commission's much lauded climate change agenda known as the Green Deal. By using the European Green Deal as our compass, we can turn the crisis of this pandemic into an opportunity to rebuild our economies differently and make them more resilient. EU Home Affairs Ministers met on Tuesday too. Most of their talks centred on the lifting of lockdowns. In this regard, they agreed that member states should not go it alone. Close cooperation between member states and coordination at the EU level remains essential if we want to avoid a second peak of the pandemics in Europe. Apparently, cooperation and coordination in the EU has so far been patchy at best. Just ask Italy. Jerome Hughes, Press TV, Brussels. Good night.